and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Do you want to do roll call or you want me to? I'll do it. Uh, you, you want to do it? Oh. Commissioner Olin. Here. Commissioner Devlin. Uh, Commissioner Hernandez. Fernandez, I'm here. Fernandez, it's, it's H in the... F. Ah, I spelled it wrong. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and Commissioner O'Brien is here. Special presentation, none. General public comments. This is the time for public comments regarding issues or matters not on the agenda, but still within the jurisdiction of the Planning Commission of Wairika. Public comments period is not intended to be question and answer period or conversations with the commissioners or staff. Commissioners, when recognized by chair, may ask questions of presenter, but no action may be taken by the Planning Commission during the public comment section of the meeting except to direct staff to prepare a report or place an item on a future agenda. Please speak from the podium. Please state your name for the record prior to providing your comments. Please address the commission as a whole. If you have documents to present, please provide a hard copy to the clerk or planning director. Please limit your remarks to three minutes. Does anyone have anything to say to address the commission? No? Right. Staff and commissioners' comments. Members of the Planning Commission may make brief announcements, reports, or request staff to report to commission on any matter at a subsequent meeting. A housing element update. Thank you. Just want to let you know, we transmitted our housing element. It was adopted by the city council at a four to one vote. It was transmitted today to the state department of housing and community development. Um, we did get confirmation that they got our submission. So we met our deadline and we will continue to work through that element and programs. Um, I'm really excited for the commission at your next meeting. Um, we are gonna be adding an item that's not mentioned on your future agenda items, which is the vacant property analysis that we've already completed. And then uh, I'm hoping to have the housing condition surveying completed as well, but um, we may need some more time on that item. And so that way we're gonna just start plugging along on the programs that are within that adopted document. So that's kind of our next step is to work through that. And, uh, and if I haven't mentioned it previously, we have submitted a grant application to the State Department of Housing and Community Development, um, which was approved by council uh, at the end of 2022 that will hopefully fund our comprehensive zoning code update. So hopefully in the next year um, with a conclusion in 2024, we'll have all of the zoning updates that are in the housing element completed as part of that update. And then we will have uh, the vacant analysis and housing conditions for you to, to consider in the next couple months. This is Jason Ledbetter, city manager. I just wanted to chime in. First of all, I wanna thank the, the planning commission I uh, also want to thank the city council for adopting the housing element. Um, but this document that is going to come back to you guys, uh, the site analysis is going to cover uh, two major pro possible projects for the city. The first is home key. So they've analyzed three different motels in the area. Uh, I think um, Mountain View, Jefferson, and Budget. Oh, they did yeah. do that? Okay. Um, so 
there's the possibility of refurbishing a motel, which would be a non-congregate shelter and kind of be the middle tier of uh, the continuum of care system and help alleviate the unhoused issue within the city of Wairika. And then the second item is really we're looking to the planning commission to help guide us on advice to the city council on possible housing. And so that is going to be a huge opportunity for you guys to weigh in because we are just sitting waiting with uh, housing tools going for a request for qualification to bring a developer in to partner with us to go for a grant to fund one of these housing opportunities or the cottage cluster missing middle housing that we've been talking about. Um, so passing that housing element is now leading to the possibility of development that you guys are going to play a very big role in. So thank you. Yeah, and we will have uh, 13 vacant sites that we've analyzed for eligibility for various grant programs, as well as the tax rebates associated with providing different housing. And so we will basically bring that to you with this report um, and to get your feedback on which lots you would recommend the city council focus on first. Obviously, we would love to do 13 large scale projects at the same time, but we do not have the capacity to do that. Um, so we're very excited to move forward with that as we complete the rest of the general plan update. Consent agenda. All matters listed under, con under the consent agenda are considered routine and non-controversial and will be enacted by one motion unless any member of the commission wishes to remove an item for discussion or a, a member of the public wishes to comment on an item. So A is approval of minutes of the regular meeting held January 18th, 2023. Uh, all those who approve say aye. I'll go through the roll call here because um, there was some criticism yeah. of just an aye and a no. Uh, on the thing. So we have to have a motion for that first before you. Yes. I, I motion that we approve the minutes of the regular meeting held January 18th, 2023. All right. Second. I second. I second. All right. So, uh, Commissioner Ola. I approve. Aye. Aye. Commissioner Devlin. Aye. Commissioner Fernandez. I need to spell it wrong. Oh. It is, isn't it? Let me go through. Okay, we will fix that. I thought it was Fernandez and I kept calling you her now. I'm so sorry. That's okay, Retta. So Commissioner okay. Fernandez, aye. And Commissioner O'Brien, aye as well. So the motion is passed. Public hearings, A. 2022-33, Carnegie Library, Historic Building, Exterior Alteration, Public Hearing. The Planning Commission will consider the following Historic Building, Exterior Alteration application filed, filed by ORW Architecture on behalf of the Siskiyou Economic Development Council. The, propo the proposed project consists of the installation of a balcony to the existing Carnegie Library, 412 West Minor Street. The balcony addition is planned in conjunction with the historic rehabilitation of the building in, intended for reuse by Siskiyou County Economic Development Council. Thank you. And we do have uh, SEDC here. Uh, if you have any questions on the rehabilitation, um, this is a very straightforward request. Um, it is actually not a conditional use permit, but it follows very similar procedures um, with noticing and consideration by the Planning Commission. So the historic district, uh, historically, um, had a historic commission that would have reviewed this application uh, and approved, denied, or conditioned it. Um, but because that commission was discontinued, the powers of that commission was absorbed into planning commission. So we are here today to consider it. Um, so the city staff are recommending to move forward with the proposed project. The balcony addition will be on the north side of the building, which is actually on a 1979 addition that was done by the Wairika Police Department 
when they occupied the building. So there will be no removal of any significant historic architecture. And we don't believe that it would interfere with the existing uh, front facade of the building. Uh, so on page 11 of your packet, um, ORW provided a very nice project overview of the entire project for the most part, as well as providing proposed balcony materials on page 12. The proposed balcony materials will be steel grate decking, steel columns, airplane cable, and steel railings. So it'll have a very minimal design, um, not flashy or anything that we think would interfere with the architectural integrity of the building. Um, and even in the historic um, registration of the building, the 1979 edition was considered part of the historic uh, registration, um, which indicated that it was added on but did not deter from the building. So we feel it would be a, a, an adequate addition. Um, in addition to that, just for information for the Planning Commission, um, we are also adding an ADA ramp to the west side of the building, which is adjacent to the driveway function, and that's to increase access to the first floor. Um, there will all, or second floor, it's kind of a half floor situation in the building itself. Um, so we uh, typically will just automatically approve those ministerially because it in increases access for all people, as well as providing safety features for those who may need to exit the building quickly. Um, who may not be able to due to some kind of health issue. Um, it'll help with access on those perspectives. So typically when we do get a request for accommodation on a historic building, we do uh, consider that ministerially. Um, so we did not include that in part of the approval for tonight, because again, it's increasing access for people to um, access that building. We did provide the full update for you in case you wanted to take a look at everything that they're doing within the building. Um, just for the what they'll be accommodating as well. And I'll let SCDC talk about any future uses for that building. Um, but for the sake of today, uh, we are recommending that we move forward with the proposed project. Questions? About uh, two years ago, uh, I was given a tour of the uh, library uh, with a city council member by um, it's, it's the city engineer. And I didn't realize that it was in a two-part building. Mm -hmm. There's the original, the original 1915 library, and then the 7980 edition. And the the edition, it, I, I'm not an architect, but it, um, it 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 had no saving graces as far as I could see. It was just functional. utilitarian, yes, yeah, functional, yes. right? And a GPA Consulting was uh, on contract with ORW, and we included their uh, rehabilitation project finding of no adverse effect on the historic nature of the building, um, just to confirm that there'd be no architectural changes to the front of the facade, and they'll be maintaining as much of the historic mm -hmm. um, interior as possible. Um, and I agree, yes, the 79 edition wasn't the most um, architecturally significant. Uh, but it worked for what YPD needed it for at the time. So the addition is a little annex, mm -hmm. off, like to the east of the library. To the north. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's added to the back. And so when you look at the, oh, add to the back. Oh, okay. yep. Yeah. So if you kind of look at the side of the building, it's almost slightly lower mm -hmm. than the original. I'm not sure why they chose to do it that way. Um, I think it really was just to add additional office space and accommodations for YPD at the time. Oh. Mm -hmm. I'm slightly curious, um, why a balcony? It seems more suited to Southern Italy or Spain. I think uh, my understanding, and I know uh, Tanya's here and can probably talk to it oh. more, um, is to provide just additional space, especially for the future use of the building. So I'll let you take it away if you'd like. You actually answered it very well. Um, thank you for the question. I'm Tanya Douse, and I'm with the Siskiyou Economic Development Council, and we're really excited to be presenting these plans today. The idea of the balcony is just to make the office space on the um, top floor more pleasant and a quality environment for our um, team. The um, I agree with your comment wholeheartedly about the addition. I think the balcony improves it. <laughs> Did you guys have any other questions for Tanya, the applicant? Question um, is, did you, um, did you look at the style of the 
materials we're using and is that the best style that will go with the particular era and style of the library? I'd ask Alia to join me, but we worked with a team of professionals led by a firm that specializes in historic buildings and historic renovations, and they really guided the selection of materials and kept us within an appropriate choice, um, you know, to keep, to maintain the historic integrity of the building. And I was reading uh, up on the Canada libraries, and apparently... There are over 1,600 in the USA. It's incredible mm -hmm. figure, isn't it? There are 600 in Great Britain, apparently. Mm -hmm. And one of the, the very first library I went to was a humble eight-year-old who was a Carnegie Library. And I was very impressed with the building. It was, uh, right, it was the, apart from the town hall, it was the most impressive building in town. There weren't very impressive buildings in a coal mining town in the north of England. Yeah, I think it was a very similar situation for Wairika as well. If you take a yeah. look at the National Registry on the history of the building itself, uh, Wairika had one of the first libraries in Siskiyou County, and this was one of their facilities back in the early 1900s. And I also read that Carnegie approved the buildings, but didn't provide any books. Oh. So the local authority had to provide the books. Interesting. Well, I look forward to having that building restored and bring some life back to that end of that town. I think what you put together is outstanding. Yes. I agree. Yeah. I believe we still need to open up if there's any other public comment. Any public comments? Doesn't seem so. Um, I must say, I am so, so glad that we sold the building instead of giving it to the Eastmans for just, uh, or the East, for just the, the, the what is that called? Genealogy? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm just so glad it went this way. And it's actually getting used and getting refurbished and put back together. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. So the recommended action is move to adopt Planning Commission Resolution 2023-03, approving the proposed exterior alteration to the Carnegie Library Building, 412 West Minor Street, and adoption of California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA Class 3 exemption. Is there a motion to approve? I'll second. So, uh, Commissioner Olam, your Aye. vote. Commissioner Fernandez. Aye. Commissioner Devlin. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. So the motion is passed. Good, thank you. Thank you guys for coming. Yes. Business, uh, MC 2022-03 Underground regula Regulations. The Planning Commission will review and consider the first draft of changes to the Municipal Code relating to underground aerial activities, utilities, aerial activities, aerial utilities. Recommended action provides staff direction. Thank you. So uh, again, this is a really good process, uh, how I like to go through it, which is an iterative process. And so um, we were explaining to Commissioner Oland prior to the start of the meeting um, at our November meeting, we just talked about the topic in general, got some general direction from the Planning Commission. And so this is our first draft to go over a couple of things. And we have some prompts for tonight to kind of clarify how you'd like to move forward. And so what we heard at the November 16th meeting is that you would like to see new construction and new subdivisions underground overhead utility lines, um, which I did provide on page 43, a synopsis of a new Senate bill 884, which was signed into law last year. 
and took effect this year, which requires all of the electric utilities to start undergrounding and planning for undergrounding of power lines uh, in very high wildfire severity zones. Um, so this is kind of a, you know, we're most likely going to see the power companies moving in this direction and being required to do so. Um, it should be noted that the majority of the city of Wairika is not considered a very high fire severity zone under the CAL FIRE distinction of that. We have small parts of it on the extreme west side of the city and small parts of it in the extreme south side of the city that are. And so those portions will eventually need to be undergrounded by the power utilities. And so uh, this is basically our, our first draft of the local regulations related to that. I have also heard um, from some of our builders at this time who are building new single family residences that Pacific Power is requiring them to underground um, if they already if they don't already have access to power. So they are already enforcing this on their side of things. Um, so I think this would uh, dovetail really nicely with that. So one of the things I really want to go over today that we kind of discussed at the pre uh, previous November meeting is how are we going to plan to retrofit the system? That's gonna be the big dollar amount. When are we going to trigger that? How are we going to you know, move through this process of undergrounding in a realistic way that isn't going to price people out? And so one of the things we ran into and actually our assistant city manager, Retta, uh, assisted with some of the financing pieces as well for the ordinance uh, that are open for discussion. And so, you know, the thing we're running into is you don't want to require public improvements on a retrofit of curb gutter sidewalk if you're going to also be requiring undergrounding at some point, which is why in our first draft, we're recommending that they occur at the same time um, if we're going to be putting those things in. Now, that being said, I think we've talked about this in the past of the public improvements policy for retrofitting in general probably needs to be looked at in a more kind of innovative and flexible way. Um, for uh, people coming in and building and doing renovations. And so right now our trigger, we have a couple of options for triggering in the proposed draft that starts on page 50. Uh, so right now we're recommending six different instances of when retrofitting would go into effect. And so what we would like to do is not necessarily go on a property by property basis, but we wanna recommend going on a block by block basis. And so although they would be required to do the retrofitting, um, we had this discussion about sewer laterals as well. So the city does have some issues with sewer laterals from the home to the sidewalk because they're still old clay pipes. And so there's a bigger discussion going on of, you know, at the time of sale or at certain times we can go in and, you know, take a look at requiring inspections or requiring some kind of financial measure being recorded with the property um, to at least note that this person has agreed to or has already paid an in lieu fee to the city so that at the time of the block or a large construction project where we can get in and do that easily, we would then apply those dollars to that certain circumstance. And so we're trying to uh, work on some language to kind of go in that direction. And of course, that's up for discussion with the commission and how you want to do that. Um, but, you know, with the overhead power lines and telecommunications utilities, it's going to make more sense doing it in large blocks. So at the time of any of these things happening that we're recommending on page 52 as the triggers, we would then go into negotiation with the property owners and state, you know, this is now a triggered requirement. Here are your financing options. Um, if we do happen to have like Southern Oregon is, has a road project, if we have something like that, we can do their portion of the underground entrenching to the home uh, and do that as part of the project and include it um, or have the individual property owner do that at the time of the project. Um, so we're trying to kind of approach it from that way so that we're not getting one property undergrounds and then everyone else has overhead. We're trying to basically create a fund of that property owner's portion of the undergrounding or a, a certain percentage. We have not ran through the in lieu calculations yet. We wanted to get your input before going through all the financial calculations if that's an option so that we can start doing these in a larger scale. So one of the things that we're hoping to do is we're, we haven't heard back yet, but we have put in for a California Office of Emergency Services grant to get a hazard mitigation and disaster planning position that would then help us apply for grants. 
Uh, and one of the grants that are available to us for hazard mitigation is undergrounding because it's good for high wind events, high snow events, ice events. Um, the thing with those grants is it can fund a very, very large pot of money, but it requires at least a 25% match. And so if we approach it from trying to do this from a hazard mitigation standpoint, we could then keep the in lieu or the financing options low for property owners to only make up that small portion of what that 25% would be. So we will have to go through and do some calculations just based off of our conversation today um, and look at what that would look like. So we would keep the cost down to the private property owner and commercial businesses as much as possible. Um, so, you know, it's a very interesting utility because when we go to underground, it will have to do large spots of it. It's not going to be possible for individual property owners to do it one at a time mm -hmm. because you'll have basically lines go down and then back up continuously, which doesn't actually work for the infrastructure. That makes a little bit of sense. May I ask a question, Anne or Lynn? Um, who is responsible for the above drowned lines? Oh, sorry. It's okay. <laughs> uh, who is responsible for the above ground lines within the city limits? Is it the city or is it the power company? It would be the power company. They exist within um, easements, utility mm -hmm. easements that are part of a franchise agreement with the city. Um, but once the power lines do extend from the easement to the home and provide power, which is what we call the last mile, yes. um, that would be on the responsibility of the property owner. My question is, if it is the power company that's responsible, it seems to me that the liability of fire from the power lines uh, lies with the power company and it would benefit them to limit this liability by laying the underground lines. Also the land or the homeowner has already paid once to bring the power to this existing home or business. And uh, I would think that the retrofit would be the responsibility of the power company, not the landowner and not the city. So yeah, so the power companies are not compelled to underground. So even with the liability associated with wildfires, the cost of undergrounding solely put onto the power utility is not enough to incentivize them to do so, um, which is why, again, we're seeing uh, state regulation come into effect where the state legislatures are now enforcing these power companies to go underground. Mm -hmm. So if you remember a couple of years ago, after the 2018 fires, they passed new state legislation to do all of the wildfire retrofits to the line. Right. And so we have kind of those interesting um, spacers that they put between the lines. So that was their fix for wildfires. And of course, now we're seeing that that doesn't necessarily do that. Right. So now they're being compelled to underground in only high, very high wildfire severity zones. So in their circumstance, you know, I, I would love to say, yes, it is the liability of the power company, but it's going to be incredibly difficult to get them to move on that when the interior of the city is not listed as very high fire severity, so they don't see the nexus in doing that. Um, <clears throat> one of the other reasons for undergrounding and kind of the impetus, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is, you know, we typically underground not just for public safety, but for aesthetic purposes and correct. keeping clear skies. Yeah. Um, and the conversation came into effect on the Highway 3 project will not be undergrounding any dry utilities. And so if we would have had an ordinance in place that requires that, which we did include that in the proposed first draft that any public or private road project will have to do underground. Um, so for example, we're actually looking at um, changing our South Oregon project to include conduit in it. So we would then plan that conduit within the road project itself to again, make it cheaper in the long run. Right. So there's, those are kind of the two pieces there, um, but, they are reinstituting a state fund called uh, Rule 20A, which they took away for a little bit, but it is a specific fund that the power companies pay into that are eligible for cities to access for undergrounding projects. The problem with the Rule 20A is it never provided enough money to actually make the undergrounding project financially feasible for right. cities to instigate. And so that's why the conversation around fire danger and hazard mitigation comes up because there are more potential pots of money 
available to us to bring the cost of that down and incentivize that. Um, so again, as we move through this, the power company will be essential. You know, anytime we underground, they will have to be part of that conversation. We will have to make sure that the engineering standards for the undergrounding mm -hmm. um, boxes is done to their um, standard as well. And so they will have to be part of this, but I don't think that their liability is high enough yet in comparison to the cost to underground. And I don't think we would see that for some time, or at least until there's more um, state regulation to force them to underground, or even local regulations such as these to force them to underground on new projects. So may I ask what the what motivated the city to want to start this project now when there isn't, a, you're saying there isn't a lot of funding available? So this was brought to us actually by uh, commissioners. A uh, planning commission instigated this to look at what the options were. Um, and again, from the perspective of hazard mitigation and from the perspective of aesthetics and open skies. And so that's the impetus for this, but I'll let the commission kind of speak to that on why it's being brought forward. Um, so kind of just to back up a little bit, items can be brought to the planning commission either by city staff um, being charged by the city council or the commissioners themselves can request to hear an item. And so this was requested. Um, because I was thinking in, in regards to hazard mitigations, maybe sidewalks should be considered. Yes. Yeah. And, and and we do have some projects going on for that too. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Just like take a minute to say that I started reading through the proposed new draft, the mm -hmm. old regulations, and recalling our conversations from a couple of months ago, we were looking at how we could start to underground in the city for aesthetics. You brought up, we might have some grant funding available. Um, number one, for me personally, I'm not looking to force somebody to underground their utilities at their home. It's very expensive. Um, like you mentioned, it's, it's already been done once, but I would like us to look for opportunities in the grant funding or maybe looking at, at uh, high traffic areas, the, the Highway 3, the, the major like on uh, Oregon Street, where we have telephone poles down the middle of the sidewalks and we have a lot of uh, foot traffic. But maybe we could uh, look at grant funding possibilities, ways to mitigate those costs, and then just kind of develop a plan that phases that in mm -hmm. into this is a primary area, secondary area, and then it's a, it's expensive, even at 25% of yes. whatever. Um, and I, I just put utilities underground and, uh, and uh, yeah. so anyway, that's my, that's my thought on it. I would like to continue this maybe to the next meeting yes. just because yes. there was so much information there. That, yeah. Um, yeah, I agree. I really didn't get it wrong. Yeah, that's like I said, that that's going to be my intent when we do bring things like this to you that I do want you to take time and I, I like to start broad and give you something to work with. And then, as I said before, we haven't done the environmental review, we haven't done public hearings or public outreach. Um, and then we have to do kind of a fiscal impact assessment. Again, if we do move into the in loop B option. Um, so for the phased approach, what we can do at the next meeting, as well as I can provide um, larger scale mapping to see if we can work through what sure. you would consider the high priority areas to be, or if you want to discuss that tonight, um, how you would like us to analyze what would be high, low, medium, or however you would like to do it. Um, the other thing you can do is we can set criteria and put that into a policy and say, you know, we want to prioritize areas with higher traffic or whatever you would like to do. So uh, I just made a note for myself to bring back uh, a mapping activity so that we can be very clear on where you would like to focus first. But just to kind of summarize too, so uh, you would like the majority of undergrounding to be placed on the city as public improvement, public infrastructure projects. Is that, yes. is that clear? Yes. Um, in terms on new development, so for example, say we have the Shopco building property that property has a sinkhole on it, that project will most likely have to do a complete renovation of that property. Would you like us to have in the ordinance or have regulations that would require 
any new kind of development like that to automatically have it underground, uh, undergrounded on the property if they're going to be doing a large scale remodel such as that. So not necessarily undergrounding in the public right of way, but undergrounding from the building to the public right of way, which is what we call the last mile. So there's kind of two pieces to that discussion, and I think you were kind of getting at that too. Well, the, so the other yeah. part of that, it's it's not quite just bringing conduit to the uh, sidewalk, because at that point, civic power requires you to buy vaults, buy transformers, mm -hmm. uh, pay for the wire, pay for their time. Um, those, mm -hmm. those costs do add up. Uh, in the case of a remodel, if it's if it's a burn down and we're redoing the building and it's not the same footprint, or um, I would, you know, it's basically a new building at that point. I'd probably say yes, but if we're just if if somebody can have an option of keeping a building useful and keeping the wires, um, what I think we would want is to is to I guess prevent something like the shop pro building from being, you know, a useful building mm -hmm. and renovated simply because they don't want to tap on that extra $50,000 or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. um, because it's just the last one. It's a small, it's not enough of a change to affect the aesthetic of mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I agree with Commissioners Devlin and Fernandez that the thing that will will uh, commit itself to most people a wire eaker is how much am I going to pay mm -hmm. for this? And I mean, it, 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 if it's a few hundred, that's one thing. But if if it increases rapidly, then you may get a lot of uh, kickback. Mm -hmm. So um, just, again, I ask questions to clarify. It helps me draft this better to meet your needs. Does, does it matter to you if the renovation is commercial versus residential? So for example, we take the Shopco building, typically our larger scale commercial builders um, who are doing something on like a property such as that, or Siski Crossroads is a good example, a, a large scale multifamily um, development they undergrounded on their property that last mile portion and they had no issue with it because they were able to make the economies of scale work. So um, for retrofitting last mile, would would you entertain a section that would only apply to commercial and multifamily as long? And, and you know, we can easily go in here. And I think we do have a couple of um, I did make sure to make the ordinance robust in terms of uh, flexibility for, you know, single cases. So we do have in here that the public works director or their designee may authorize overhead poles, lines, associated structures. Yeah, they, I, yeah. I actually don't like that language in there. I don't want to leave anything up to our public works director. Okay. It's, it's just not fair. We did put in there the appeal process to planning commission. So if people okay. don't agree with his designation or or um, the designee's designation, we do have the section 11.21.090 because I knew this was going to come up. And so I wanted to make sure that it has a robust appeals process. And so appeals can be filed um, after the decision and it, it basically gets appealed to the planning commission. And then anything the planning commission decides, it could also be appealed to the city council. So we did program in there a more robust due process system that we have not right. necessarily as had. As, as long as we have a mechanism to move from public yeah. works director to you know not having the absolute last word on mm -hmm. how we develop every mm -hmm. property. I agree. Yes, I did. I did put that in there, and I would argue to keep at least one level of ministerial approval because you know it takes a lot of time and money for oh, developers yeah. to come here, yeah. and so we really don't want to discourage that. And some developers do get very weird about coming in front of public well, I don't, groups. I don't see every project yeah. going to the public works director having an objection, but when there are, yeah. you know, or in the case that there would be, that there should be some mechanism to, to move that forward. Yes. Yeah. And actually it, it should be noted that due process exists for everyone. And so due process basically means that we have to give you the ability 
to appeal different de decisions. And so, for example, for code enforcement administrative citations, when our code enforcement officer issues that, it then can be appealed to a hearing officer. We have other mechanisms throughout the code where um, Jason, the city manager, basically can review uh, appeals to say like my internal decisions. Um, but for something like this that is planning related, typically anyone is able to appeal anything. And so um, any other public improvements that people may not agree with can be appealed to this body and it can be appealed to Jason as well, depending on the circumstance. I think what we haven't been doing very well in the past with our municipal code is listing that and having people know that. And so that's okay. something I'm trying to program into these updates as we go through to make people aware of their options if they don't agree with something, right. because it, it happens, you know, and we yeah. want to make sure that people have um, due process under the law for mm -hmm. that. So um, we did, we did include that in here. Um, and Commissioner Fernandez pointed out to me that there are certain triggers in here if you're doing mm -hmm. um, uh, renovations to your property gets to a certain dollar amount that would trigger automatic. You have to do that. I am opposed to any of those. Okay. Um, anybody, I mean, I'm just going to use my house as a, as a case study. Um, I have bids 25 to 50,000 just to reroute. So if I go to reroute, then I don't want to have to underground or, you know, and I know certain neighborhoods here, you know, sidewalks are never going to happen. They don't belong there. This, you know, so these things that trigger those mm -hmm. those kind of uh, improvements, I don't think we need written into our our ministry code. Okay, yeah, that is just in um, that is the exact same. So that section, any person who constructs, alters, improves, that's direct language with existing municipal code. Um, that's set at the thirty thousand um, dollars, and that's I think a bigger conversation on public improvements in general. And I mean, it kind of follows the same kind of thought process of as we develop as a city and we look at some of the historic pieces, yes, there are definitely gonna be neighborhoods um, where curb gutter sidewalk doesn't work, uh, underground power lines don't work for a variety of reasons, which we try to have those um, kind of flexibility pieces in there, as I said before. But I think the the conversation comes in on when when is it appropriate to start to get people to conform to new design standards, especially public improvements. Um, obviously, we would love to do it under city projects, and I think we're becoming more competent and able to do that. I think in the past, um, one of the things we've talked about is in the next year or two, we need to talk about how we're doing roadway projects and infrastructure because they're very few and far between because of how expensive they get for even on our side. So I think typically we've been averaging, what, one road project every seven years? Two. Two to three, which is actually really good. Yeah, um, it doesn't exist. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I just, but, I just see yeah. that, that old policy of you know a certain dollar amount triggering sidewalks. It's just a failed policy. You drive around this, drive around the town and the and the hit and miss areas where we have a sidewalk and don't. It's it's almost laughable. You know, you have fifty feet of sidewalk and then there again. Yeah, and also I I'm just wondering when what that dollar amount. When did that come Because thirty thousand dollars back in two thousand, yeah, was half a house. Now oh, it's. It used to be ten, and I believe they raised it. Retta, correct me if I'm wrong. It used to be ten, and they raised it in eighteen seventeen. Yeah, and there are additional exemptions to that in the public improvements code. Um, yeah, it, it typically what we would advocate for from a planning side is a percentage of either square footage being impacted by uh, an alteration or a percentage of the valuation of the project itself in comparison to the value of the property. Um, that might be something that's easier to figure out if you swallow, but mm -hmm. or easier to accept, but um, even from 17 to 23, it, there's a huge difference in property values. There's a huge difference in building materials. Okay. 
Yeah, no, this is Jason Ledbetter again. And I think um, kind of the point was to kind of spur your guys' thought process over. And I think you mentioned it earlier today to me that we already had this threshold that meant you needed to do sidewalk. And then if you were doing sidewalk and you weren't undergrounding, well, then we're just ripping that sidewalk back up to underground at some point. So it's like it just these are just things for you guys to think about. And Because it was originally something that I had brought up, um, but it's it's just the cost, mm -hmm. you know, to our to our property owners here in town. Mm -hmm. That's really hard to yeah to accept. Yeah, and that's why Retta and myself had kind of taken a look at this, offering the financing retrofitting section of this ordinance to give as many financial means to be able to still achieve the goal of retrofitting, but also give people flexibility of just not completely putting a full cost on them. Um, but one of the things that we can do is we can take that, that second one out for retrofitting existing infrastructure. Um, and we can kind of focus on some of the other ones today and just get your input on those. Um, like I said, I try to give you as many options as possible in the outright, and then we kind of can whittle down and refine from there. So I have no issue with you changing anything. So um, just to go over the retrofitting um, infrastructure. Oh, go. Um, do we have an idea of how much we're talking with the retrofitting that last mile for, for standard revenue? Do we have an idea of what the cost would be? Because the cost for this, I imagine, is a whole lot less. or I will have I will reach out to Todd, who is our Pacific Power representative. I had gotten in a cost estimate from him in 2021 for undergrounding in right of way and then undergrounding in last mile. Um, and that's probably changed. So I can reach back out and get that cost per we can get it down to a cost per foot. Um, is typically what we would use. And that's what we usually use for the um, grant applications as well to understand how much money we may need um, when doing those. So we can get those for future consideration. And maybe maybe when you talk to them, if you could clarify if they are responsible for the vaults and the transformers or the homeowners. I know that the homeowners are because we are working with a current single family construction project right now where Pacific Power is putting the full cost on that person. And it's going well, to. That, that may change in a neighborhood where you have multiple yes. connection points. So, yes. I mean, we, we did it because we were the, the last on the street. So we had to provide mm -hmm. for our neighbor. So we had to bear the full cost of that. But I'm just wondering if if they are undergrounding in an entire neighborhood, if they, I mean, they have their transformers on the poles already, yeah. if they bear the cost of that. So okay. if a homeowner was only having to bring conduit to the curb, that may be a reasonable cost. And Olin, I was also worried because I know it is very expensive and I think they typically charge per foot. Mm -hmm. um, if you have, say, in the south part of the city where, <clears throat> where I think you were referring to, um, that some of those residents have been there quite some time. And I was thinking of the occupants of the properties is a lot of them are retired um, I know you have a financing option, but that can be overwhelming to seniors. And I was wondering if there was going to be some kind of help for them or because. I think ultimately, um, and that's kind of what we're trying to figure out, but I think one of the ideas that came up through this process, because folks living in that community now that if you passed this today they would not be obligated to do anything at all they, well, they, they would be no. now it would just be basically we're trying to determine what renovation at a residence would then um kind of spur the obligation for them to send a percentage of money into the underground fund 
and Juliana is advocating that that be 25% of the cost and you pool that money together and then you use that money to go seek the total project for like the entire street when when the entire street has funded um, into our coffers, we use that as the match for these hazard mitig mitigation. Um, that's much better grant. than how I did it because that's basically how we afford our water and sewer projects. So when we do a Proposition 218, which determines your utility bill rates, um, we assume, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think PACE projects about a third of the cost can is not covered by a grant. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, and so when we go ahead and we do those utility um, studies, there is a portion of that we assume is not going to be grant funded, and that's what turns into your utility bill for improvements on the system. Okay. And so this would be a very similar function to that where we wouldn't expect people to be able, especially in the retrofitting, we wouldn't expect people to be able to fund the entire project. And so when we would go in and do those, um, we would factor in, we would probably assume they can only cover the 25% the of their portion. So not a total block, but their fair share portion of that, that mechanism. Um, but this is really good. This gives me a lot to go on to for today, but I just wanted to go through the retrofitting situations and just get your, your initial for some of these other ones. So all existing poles, above ground power boxes, lines and associated overheaded structures used to supply electric service, communication or similar services shall be undergrounded in the following situations. At the time of a public or private project to replace or improve roads, non-motorized trails, or pedestrian infrastructure. So we included the non-motorized trails or pedestrian infrastructure because the uh, Wairika Greenway project came up as a project where we kind of wish we would have put a conduit under the trail in preparation for using it for undergrounding for power lines and telecommunications infrastructure. And so that's why we included the non-motorized trail piece. It's actually very easy to put conduit under uh, mm -hmm. a foot trail. That's actually where a lot of uh, fiber goes through a lot of uh, forest land areas. Um, I'll skip over number two, because right now I have that noted as being taken out, which is the $30,000 threshold. Damage or destruction of existing <laughs> poles above ground power boxes, overhead lines, and or associated associated overhead structures due to wildfire, flood, or other catastrophic event. So this can be funded in those circumstances through grants, um, disaster recovery grants. So um, we want to be explicit and include that sometimes in our municipal codes, because if we don't, it's kind of like the Highway 3. If we don't explicitly talk about it and require it, there's no hook for these other agencies to pay for it and do it on their projects. So that's why we included that. At the discretion of the fire chief, if they determine that the existence of the poles, above ground power boxes, overhead lines, and or associated overhead structures shall constitute an imminent threat to human life and or property. This is actually an existing code section in the fire code right now. Um, so our fire chief, Jerry Lemus, can go. So say, for example, there's an old po pole that's decaying or the ground is subsiding and it's starting to lean, if it's causing an imminent threat, um, he does have that ability to require that to be undergrounded or repaired, depending on you know, what the circumstance is. Um, this was an interesting one uh, at the time of property transfer, and that's just to um, include that into the property transfer itself is that cost. Again, this is just recommendation. And then the final one is at the time that a simple majority of properties on a given block have financed the cost of their portion to underground overhead utilities, a block is defined as the smallest group of buildings that is bordered by a city streets, not, um, sorry, by streets, not counting any type of thoroughfare within the area of a building or comparable structure. So I think number six kind of gets to your point with number two with the $30,000 threshold is taking a look at, say, for example, we do have newer construction that had undergrounded for over 50% of that block. Um, going back and requiring those other people to also underground is basically what that would do. And we would work on the financing mechanism for that. Um, so those are up for kind of your, your thought process, if you have any thoughts tonight. Um, I think we're pretty clear from what I can hear on the new construction. 
But I think the retrofitting is going to be something that we we speak more about, and even in relation to other public improvements. Yeah, we might want to have some public comment on that. And yeah. Maybe yes. Figure some creative ways to make it so it's not painful. To yeah. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So like I said, I will take out number two for sure. I will keep the others for your consideration at the next meeting. And so that you just have time to think it over, talk it over. Um, but I have made a number of notes and then um, I would just request that you take public comment tonight if anyone would like to. Yes, would anyone like to make public comment? Uh, Lorenzo Love, uh, a lot of people, a lot of homeowners here are like me. Retired on fixed income, even 25% of this last month. I know people are going to lose their homes. Mm -hmm. This is going to make people, it's not as simple as digging a trench. If you have nothing but lawn in front of your house, maybe. In my case, I have a retaining wall, I have a, a cement fence. And landscaping, a concrete walkway, all that's got to be ripped out. But you go through the fence, and the fencing board that comes into play. And that's a whole other ball of wax. I'd probably have to replace the entire fence. And that's a, this is going to be an enormous cost to homeowners. We do. This is a small town. We, we don't need to. This is just too much. Thank you. John Marantry, um, same, but <laughs> it also says in there the entire city. City limits, the entire city. So, you know, what is the plan for the entire city? You know, is it all going to happen like boom, bang? Is it all going to happen over 20 years? You know, what what is this entire city thing? I think we need to really look at that. Thanks. Skip? <laughs> Would you like me to address the... Yes, please. Yeah. Actually, that is a, a statutory requirement. So the California Public Utilities Commission requires cities that wish to underground to declare districts. So you either need to create a districting plan, which doesn't make sense in our circumstance because we're so small. So when you go to certain cities like Palo Alto, Huntington Beach, uh, Long Beach, their city is separated into separate undergrounding districts that are governed under other different types of quasi-governmental entities. And so we have to include language within the ordinance that declares the city as a whole, a district to be eligible for those rural 20A dollars and to be eligible to even require people to underground in general for new construction or retrofit. So um, the, the section that Don Marie, I believe, is, is referencing is, 50, is on page 50. We have to have that language within the ordinance to be able to enforce it um, under the, the state law. Um, but in terms of kind of going back to the greater question of phasing and development, um, so as it states in the current proposed draft, you would only require undergrounding in the cases of new construction. And then for the retrofitting, it would be those cases that we went over um, just recently, those would then require people to individually do that. Um, and then, like I said, in that block setting. So once the block gets to 50% plus one, that would be when we trigger to do that project under the current way that we have this worded. Um, but as I said before, I think this is really good input. We can go through and kind of play with this a little bit more, as well as come up with some complementary policy documents. So typically with a municipal code, you know, going back to the fixed income, seniors, um, different circumstances like that, we don't typically put that specific language within the municipal code itself. But what we would do is when we do the implementation with the code, we would have a complementary document. So as I said before, if we do the in lieu fee financing mechanism, we would have to do a report showing what the in lieu fee would be that would be adopted via resolution with a policy document that can be more easily 
um, amended as those dollar amounts change. And so we wouldn't advocate it to go into a municipal code section because you don't want municipal code to change every year. You want it, it, it is flexible in terms of we can go back and fix things if something happens. But when you're providing a financing program, you usually want to do that in a resolution policy document. And so we would have several different things available to do that and, and accommodate people as we go through that process. Um, and Olin, could you do like a lien on the property for to be collected at, at the sale or something mm -hmm. like that? Yep. Okay. Yeah, that's why we included the language. Um, each affected residential or non-residential property owner may elect to finance the cost of their service connection, and they shall add, execute a loan agreement in lieu fee or other mutually agreed upon financing measure to cover the proportional cost to underground the overhead utilities for that property. And that last part's like a summary, but um, that's why we had put at the time of property transfer, um, because theoretically we could, you know, include that with the property sale. Um, it, it is a mechanism that is used in other cities. Um, but again, if you don't feel it's appropriate for this city, we can take that into account. Mm -hmm. And not only does the cost per foot, but if you know, figure out what an average cost would be for standard. I, I think that's gonna be really important because I'm in agreement with I think one, three, and four mm -hmm. on that on that those you know retrofitting standards, but I'm really questioning number five and I don't like number two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. That that this is how this process works. So I just want to make sure we're clear. And sometimes I'll ask you guys questions and clarify, but I just I want to make sure that I'm communicating your intent and what you want to do so that I can bring you the best option forward at the next meeting. And it's and also I just want to reiterate that it's not something that every homeowner is going to have to do. Correct. And maybe ever. Yes. Right. Ab absolutely. I just wanted to kind of touch on number two. I mean, it's an arbitrary number. Yeah, we're basing it off of this other number, but hypothetically, you could advocate. Uh, equal to the current value of the house, right? Or somebody's coming in and they're just renovating $500,000. The expectation now is that they will underground, right? And so it's, and I, I also want to touch on the commentary from the public is that we certainly are not advocating for anybody to be forced into doing this. It's more of if they are going to renovate their house and they have the excess, ability. yeah, they have the money to do $350,000 or whatever this, commission decides that then we would be advocating that they pay 25% into this fund. So in a perfect world, we'd be able to do it via road projects. That would be the ideal. Yeah. And I think what's important is to know what is that 20 percent mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Kind of a dollar sign to that. So mm -hmm. we know what we're deciding on. Perfect. perfect. And also, I just wanted to also mention that I know that, um, PPNL has been adamantly against undergrounding on the PSPS meetings that I entertain Mr. Andrus on and has even claimed to say that, well, undergrounding has, poses all of these other uh, issues with, um, you know, water in the ground and all that. But ultimately, the government is now forcing them to underground. And so we will see, I would assume, the trend continue, even as Juliana's mentioned, that we may not be considered in a high danger area at the moment, but who knows what the future holds. It certainly appears that undergrounding is the future. And they underground in plenty of wetter states than California. So, I mean, the argument of it's not feasible due to water table, things like that, um, is not necessarily true. I've seen it work in cities that are built on wetlands. I've seen it in cities that are you know, again, the Midwest, we have a lot of water. Just, you know, it's, you should drink it though. Um, <laughs> it's just not clean water. So I think that's a, that's, that's kind of a defunct argument in my experience. But um, yes, it, like I said, in an ideal world, I would love to be able to pay for all of it, to be undergrounded and not have people be charged. Um, again, that's always the balance that we come up with in planning is trying to get to that end goal while not negatively impacting people. 
as much as possible. So thank you. This gives me a lot to go on. Now then we're not supposed to be in a high fire area, but several months ago, we were all uh, under orders to evacuate almost. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And our insurance rates are Yes. yes. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Well, yes. and that goes to as well. There's a lot more grant dollars being made available as well for home hardening. And so again, home hardening um, can include metal roofs. It can include better fire resistant or fire retardant siding. Um, it could include undergrounding the last mile. I think we could make a logical argument as we go for those programs. Um, again, that's part of the the housing element is preserving housing. And so I think that's a good argument as we go for those programs to make sure we include that aspect and could potentially get funding for that in that way. So, okay, thank you. You know, this a general plan 2044 visioning. The planning commission will receive a report on the status of the visioning survey and review the schedule for developing the 2044 general plan vision. Recommended action, provide staff direction. Thank you. This is going to be very quick. Um, we are currently still accepting submissions for the visioning survey. I'm actually working uh, with a couple of different organizations to outreach to some of the groups that we haven't been hitting. Um, we currently are, um, as I present on page 55, our visioning responses are currently skewed and not representative of the community yet. And so right now we are skewing highly female. Uh, we are skewing higher income. So people who make more than $100,000 a year have been the majority of the participants. Um, and then uh, people with higher education, which all three of those markers are very, very typical for, for these types of surveys. Women usually take surveys more than men. Higher education level and higher income typically um, take surveys more. So what we are trying to do in the next month um, prior to your next meeting is to outreach to those other groups that we um, haven't necessarily heard from to make sure that there is an equal representation. Um, so we are recommending that we go out for youth members. So those who are between the ages of 18 and 25 um, although people under 18 may take the survey, um, there are ethical issues with surveying people under the age of 18 because they are not legal adults. Mm -hmm. And so we, as a planning profession, do not directly outreach to them if they are under 18, unless a parent is present or a parent consents to that. Um, and so we do have a couple of things that I'll be doing uh, with the high school in a classroom setting where it is monitored and it's more appropriate for us to be there. Um, I've already met with the fifth and sixth grade class at Jackson Street, which was really lovely, but we didn't necessarily do visioning. Um, so we are trying to reach out to that 18 to 25 year old group. Um, and then I think we might be having the Methodist church or some other groups come in. Um, we have to be really sensitive to those younger groups in how we take their input and how we share that in the process. And so that's why when we talk about youths taking the survey, it's people 18 to 25. Um, the other thing too, is we're focusing on people, people making less than hundred thousand dollars a year, which, uh, we're calling the lower income group, even though that is obviously not low income, but we want to make sure we're getting those demographic areas covered and then trying to outreach to more male participants, um, because we have a, a very high skew towards female participation only. So we're going to be focusing on those areas, trying to get more people to get a good, representation of the community itself and, and getting those. So um, I did include a blank survey just to kind of refresh everybody on what the questions are in here. They are all optional online. So people do not have to answer these if they don't feel comfortable doing that. I um, mean, we do have plenty of people who do not answer those. Really the important questions for us when we're going through this are on page 63 of your packets, which is page seven to nine of the survey, which asks people to talk about what they feel the values and qualities of Wairika are that are unique to Wairika. What does rural and small town mean to people? Because I've worked with a number of small towns that like to say we have rural character. And then I always ask, what does that mean? And people usually are um, not able to answer that question because again, it's, you know, it's going to be very specific to each rural area. Um, and I like to bring up Siskiyou County in general Wairika is definitely not the same as Weed, definitely not the same as Mount Shasta, definitely not the same as Dunsmuir, McLeod, Doris. 
but each one of those cities, I guarantee will say they have rural character. And so it's my job to help kind of flush out what that really means for our circumstance here in Wairika and make sure that, you know, as we set this vision, it's appropriate for this city um, and is not just copying what other people do. Um, and so we will be doing that. I did also provide, uh, we did do one visioning workshop where we just focused on the qualities and values of Wairika and the rural small town and then what people would consider their vision for 2044. Um, wanted to just kind of get your your input on if if you think having another in-person workshop would be worth it, um, kind of just opening it up for your conversations on how you would like to see more public input on this item in addition to outreaching to these other core groups for the representative sample. So ideally, we would like to get this input. I'll bring the data back at the next meeting and then present a draft based on a themes analysis. So what I do is I go through all of the data and I basically go through and clean it, find common themes, common things people find interesting, and then offer a recommendation based off of what those common themes are. But you will have all of the raw data available to you to read um, ahead of time as well. All right. Future planning items, future agenda items or action items and presentations to the planning commission that may occur within the next 90 days. All dates are tentative and subject to change if needed. Um, is that? No, I can just summarize for you. Um, it looks like a lot for March 15th, but a lot of it is just going to be updates. Uh, we do have another tentative parcel map for the Evans family property, and those APNs are basically Butcher Hill. Um, so it's going to be a pretty straightforward parcel map. We're finishing up uh, some of the processes there. Um, hopefully, I would like to spend a majority of our time talking about the 2044 vision. Um, again, that may change if we don't get a lot of outreach uh, in the next month or so. And then we will be starting on our next next major portion of the general plan, which is safety and public health. And so I'll just kind of introduce that item to you as well as a public engagement plan um, for that item. And then we did just finish up our winter season noise monitoring. So hopefully at the next meeting, I'll just have a little report in the agenda for you, updating you on the noise element. Um, noise is interesting. Uh, it's not super controversial, but it kind of is. Uh, there's not much we really need to do on that element. It's very scientific. It, it relies on a lot of um, processes in the noise monitoring piece. So that's going to be a very kind of, there's not much public outreach or public engagement we do for noise um, until we get to a draft report because a lot of it is so technical. And so uh, I'll just be giving you guys an update on that. And so for the majority of our next meeting, it'll be the 2044 vision and the uh, public hearing. Thank you. Are we adjourned? If you so choose. Anybody have anything to say? No. All right.